I want to thank uh, everyone who works so hard in Vacation Bible School. The Lord bless that, and I appreciate everybody's effort, and uh, I thought the Lord blessed us with a week of his grace. Uh, here's an, another announcement. The church building has been coming in need of several updates. Uh, the original building is 30 years old, and the addition is 20 years old, and their appliances have issues. The kitchen and fellowship hall floor needs replaced, landscaping, window issues. So as the Lord enables you, give for this as you're blessed. I've entitled this message, Boldness Without Hindrance. Where do you get that type, title? Well, it says that Paul preached the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. That word is boldness. And no man forbidding him, that simply means without hindrances. Boldness without hindrance. Now, verse 30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. Now, evidently, he was in house arrest at this time. Look at uh, verse 16 of this same chapter. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. So for two years... He was in this house under house arrest with a soldier who kept him. One wonders if the Lord taught that soldier the gospel during that period. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he did. And we read in verse 30 that he received all that came unto him. He received and welcomed all who came to him. I hope we do the same thing. We want everybody to believe, don't we? And everybody ought to believe the gospel. It's true. You and I ought to believe. May God give us grace to believe. We ought to believe. This is the very truth of God. And Paul received everyone who came to him. And here is the summary of his preaching during that two-year period. What happened after that, we really don't know. Some think he may have been beheaded right after that, something three or four years later under the uh, reign of Nero, but he did die as a martyr for the cause of God and truth. But during this two-year period, we're given a summary of his preaching. He received everybody that came to him, and I like that, don't you? I want to be that person that receives everybody who hears the gospel. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's how this message was preached. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now the word confidence is usually translated boldness. When you read the word boldness, it's the same word, plainness of speech openness, not speaking in a way of trying to package the gospel and make it more appealing to the flesh with boldness. Now, let me show you what that means. Turn to Acts chapter 4. I'd like you to read this with me. Verse 7, Acts chapter 4, verse 7. 
And when they had set them in the midst, Peter and John, before the Sanhedrin, before the high priest, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? This is talking about this healing, this miraculous healing of a man who was born lame in both of his feet. How did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, saith unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jehovah, by the name of God, this man is set before you whole. Now, if he would have said that, it would have been true. But it would have been a compromise of the gospel. It would have been true. But it would have been compromising. Now, how did he answer this question? When they said, by what power, by what authority have you done this? Here's his answer. Be it known unto you, verse 10, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name. Jesus of Nazareth, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness, <laughs> that's boldness, isn't it? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, that is what boldness is that is what confidence is that is the way the gospel is to be preached with all boldness and what he says next is no man forbidding him and that simply means without hindrance without worrying about what men think without worrying about Consequences, without worrying about the outcome, without worrying about results, without worrying about the fear of man, without worrying about what it may cost, without worrying about self-interest, with all boldness and without being hindered by what men think. Let me show you what that looks like. Turn with me for a moment to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Now these are the words of the Pharisees and they had a bad motive in saying this, but look what they said in verse 15. This is the Pharisees speaking to Christ. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. That's what they wanted to do. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Now that's what it is to be without hindrance. When you preach the gospel, you don't care whether anybody, I'm not talking about indifference, but you, if, if, if nobody in here likes it, okay, it's still the truth. Now that's the only way to preach the gospel. In boldness, not trying to package it, not trying to present it in such a way as to keep from offending men, and with no hindrance, without being hindered by the fear of man, the fear of what they would think. Now the only way I want to hear a man preach the gospel is if he preaches just like that. If he doesn't, I'm not going to hear the truth. And that's what I want to hear. I want to hear the truth of God. Now that is the way 
Paul preached the gospel with boldness and without hindrance. And pray for me that I will be enabled to preach the gospel that way because I won't without his grace. With boldness and without hindrance. Now, let's look at the content of his preaching. We see his manner of preaching with boldness and without hindrance. No man forbidding him, no man stopping him from preaching the gospel as it should be preached. But the content of his gospel every day for two years can be summarized by this. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now these things can't be separated. Preaching the kingdom of God. And if I preach the kingdom of God, I will teach those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I'm dealing with that which does concern the Lord Jesus Christ, I will be preaching the kingdom of God. Now, several of the versions uh, that I've read, I always look at the different versions and I, uh, translations of uh, the English. I love the, these translations preaching the reign of God. That's what it is to preach the kingdom of God. It's to preach the reign of God. That is what that means. The royal power, the kingship, the dominion, the rule of God. The kingdom of God, the reign of God. And there is so much, so many references to the kingdom of God in the New Testament. There are hundreds. That word is used so often. But I have decided, um, I hope this is of the Lord. I believe it is. I've decided to show what the Old Testament says about his kingdom because what the Old Testament says is what the New Testament says as well. You can't separate those things. So I want to look together at what the Old Testament says about the kingdom of God. Now, this was Paul's preaching for two years. He preached the kingdom of God and those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's first consider the kingdom of God. And I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel is right after the book of Ezekiel. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, then Daniel. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned to me. It had left him. At the end of what days? Well, let's look at the first of this chapter. Verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, first, think about this. The Lord used this man to write scripture. This is a man God saved. He was the king. At that time, the most powerful man on earth, and God saved this man. He was actually used by God to write scripture. He's writing scripture at this time. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you. That's me and you right now. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs 
and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. And his dominion, his royal rule, his sovereign power is from generation to generation. He is always in control. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Everything was going well. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might know, make known unto me the interpretation of that dream. Well, Daniel is the only one who could give him the interpretation. And here's what the interpretation of that dream was, verse 16. He's given the dream, and here's the interpretation of the dream. Let his heart, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what this dream you had means, let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. You know, that's an actual psychological disorder. Uh, you can think you're an ox. You can think you're a cow. That's an actual psychological disorder that God gave him. And he was going to have it for seven years. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven years pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and, the, and demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent. Here's what you're going to learn, Nebuchadnezzar, that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream I kept Nebuchadnezzar have seen. Now thou art four old Belshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in me. Now he gave him this interpretation of what's going to take place. You're going to be turned into a beast for seven years. Now, here's what happened. Verse 7. 28. And all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar, this man who was the most powerful man on the earth. At the end of the 12 months, he walked into the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it's spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen, and seven years shall pass over you until you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and he eat grass as an oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown out like evil's feather, feathers, and his nails like bird claws. Seven years in this condition. At the end of the days, after that seven year period, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned to me. It left him, but now the Lord brings it back. Mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. Now, that doesn't mean that he conferred a blessing on him. Only God blesses. He says, I praised and honored him. I now see clearly 
who he is and who I am. I bless the most high. That's who he is. He's the most high. I praised and honored him that liveth forever. He is eternal. Whose dominion, whose royal power, whose sovereign rule, eternal sovereignty, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. Now this is speaking of God being God. His dominion. His absolute control is an everlasting dominion. Do you know he's always been in control? He's always controlled everybody and everything, and he is controlling everybody and everything right now, and he always will. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He's subject to none. He's influenced by none, doing as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases. That is who God is. He is God on his throne, working all things after the counsel of his own will. God's dominion is God being God in fact, whether just rather than in just name only. His dominion. Oh, I love the kingdom of God. God reigns. God rules. God's will is always done. If it happened, it's because God willed it. Whatever it is, God's will is always done. His will was done in creation, wasn't it? It was just him willing it. Whatever happens in providence is his will being done. Now, I don't understand why he does everything he does. Uh, it's all good. Somebody says, well, how can a good God let this happen? Don't sit in judgment on God. God knows what he's doing and you know nothing. And I know nothing as well. God reigns. God rules. He's the first cause behind everything. He's in control of everybody. And God's will is done in salvation. If you're saved, it's because he willed your salvation. Not because you willed it. It's because he willed it. God rules. God reigns. God's God. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Verse this is his kingdom, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Look at verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Nothing. Now, does that mean God doesn't care anything about man? Well, it doesn't mean that. You know that. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So don't look at that as God being uncaring about men in general. I don't care what happens to them. No, they're his creatures and he's going to save whom he will. But when it speaks of them being reputed as nothing, it means there's nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do to hinder God's will being done. Nothing. Nothing. He doeth according to his will. And there's nothing you or I can do to hinder it. As far as that goes, this thing of being a nothing, um, how much did you have to do with God electing you? Nothing. How much did you have to do with Christ paying for your sins? Nothing. It are my sins, but I didn't help him. Hebrews 1, 3 says he by himself purged our sins. How much did you have to do with you being justified before God? Nothing. How much did you have to do with you being born again, born from above? Nothing. Salvation is of 
the Lord. He doeth according to his will. Look at it, verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. How completely is God's will done in heaven? Completely, isn't it? Same thing here. Same thing here. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand. Nobody can stop him. Or say unto him, what doest thou? Give an account of your matters. You give a ring. Explain yourself. <laughs> he doesn't have to. He's God. He's altogether glorious. He's holy. He's perfect. He's just. Whatever he does is right. I think of Paul's uh, uh, knowing people would object in Romans chapter 9 when he says, For he saith to Pharaoh, I have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. Well, that would say to me, Why does he yet find fault? Who's resisted his will? If God is absolutely sovereign and no one can resist his will, how can he hold me responsible for the sin that I commit if it's all according to his will? Nay, but who are you, O oh man, to reply against God? You don't have any leg to stand on. You have no business trying to judge God. You're incapable. Your, your opinion doesn't count is what he's saying. But that's, that's, that's the truth. That's the truth. Who are you, O oh man, to reply against God? You know, when you reply against God, when I reply against God, all of a sudden we become God's judges. That's a bad place to be. There's one judge, God. You don't send judgment of him. Verse 36, at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar says, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now, at one time, he was the most powerful man in the earth, and God turned him into a beast. And he stayed out in the fields and ate grass and uh, whatever leaves, and his hair grew. It looked like feathers. He'd gone so long without a bath. His nails looked like eagle claws. He'd never, he was a beast. And then God returned to him. And his understanding returned. And he found out who God is. His kingdom is from generation to generation. And he rules over all. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, extol, and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, absolute justice. And those that walk in pride... He is able to abase. <laughs> oh, he's able to abase. Now that is God's kingdom. That is the message Paul preached, the kingdom of God. And that is what is meant by the kingdom of God. Just what I said. And Paul preached this with all boldness. He didn't apologize for this. This is who God is. And he did it without hindrances. I'm not, Paul's saying, I'm not concerned whether you agree with this or not. This is the truth with regard to the character of God. He is king. But look what he says next, back in our text, in Acts chapter 28. This is what he preached for two years, preaching the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom just described in Daniel chapter 4 is what the kingdom of God always is in the New Testament. You know, New Testament is only what the Old Testament says. It's only what the Old Testament already says. This is God. This is his kingdom. Now look what he says in verse 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if I preach the kingdom of God, 
I will preach those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I don't preach those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, I have never preached the kingdom of God. So what are those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ? Now look up at verse 23 of this same chapter. And when they had pointed him a day, there came many to him in his logic to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. That's what he preached on the first day. And that's what he preached for the next two years and every other time he preached. Now, I love the, the uh, placing of this verse of Scripture. It's the last verse in the book of Acts. Now, what comes next? Romans chapter 1. So right here on this page, we can find out exactly what is meant by preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's read these first four verses of Romans. Paul, a servant a bond slave of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God not to the gospel of men but the gospel of God which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures now this is the gospel of the old testament scriptures it's the new testament but it's the gospel of God according to the Old Testament scriptures. Now you'll notice verse 2 is in parentheses. It's a parenthetical statement. And what that means, we can lift that out and read verses 1 and 3 together with no uh, uh, confusing of the thought of what's being said. Now we know that this is the gospel of God uh, that is in the scriptures. But look, let's read verses 1 and 3 together. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now remember, he preached those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here it is. Here is what concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now there are the things that concern the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, God was manifest in the flesh through the line of David, but Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, was made flesh. He came in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, John says in 1 John 4, as a matter of fact, turn there. I want you to see this. This is so important. Hold your finger in Romans 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, 1 John chapter 4, believe not every spirit, believe not every preacher that comes along telling he's preaching the truth, but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it's in the world. Now here is a summary of everything we believe. Christ was before he came as the eternal Son of God. He came in the flesh. The Word was made flesh. 
And whatever he came to do, he did. Now that's everything we believe. Christ is the eternal Son of God. He came in the flesh. The Word was made flesh. And he did what he came to do. What did he come to do? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He did it. He did it. When the kingdom of God is preached, those things that concern the Lord Jesus Christ are taught. He's Lord. He's Lord of all. He's everybody's Lord. He's saved people's Lord. He's lost people's Lords too. You know, they're his sheep, but they're his goats too. He's Lord. He's Lord of all. He's Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He's the Savior. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. The world already was condemned. But that the world through him might be saved. He's Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God's Christ. He's God's prophet. He's the word of God. He's God's priest. If he represents you, you must be saved. He's God's king. That means he controls and rules and reigns everything. You see, he's able to make sure his will come to pass because he's king of kings. He's absolute Lord. We're to teach those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself is the good news. He's the content of the gospel. He is the content of the gospel. He's the content of scripture. Now, back to Romans 1. The gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. But he wasn't made the son of God. He was declared to be the son of God with power. You see, he's the child that was born, but the son was given eternal that's who he is. He was declared to be the Son of God, the uncreated, eternal Son of God with power. With power. You can't be the Son of God without omnipotence, can you? Uh, he's equal with the Father. Uh, there's, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the only way you can be equal with God is if you are God. No other way that can be. He's declared to be the Son of God with power. That's not an empty title. That's talking about his omnipotence. The Son of God with power. And here's what demonstrates his power. He's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. He's the only holy man to ever live. He's filled with the spirit of of holiness, the Holy Spirit. What is it that demonstrates that he is the Son of God with power? His perfectly holy life. He never sinned. When he came in the flesh, he came in the flesh to keep God's law perfectly. And he did so as he was filled with the Spirit of God. John said God didn't give him the Spirit by measure. He had the fullness of the Spirit. And he lived a perfectly holy life. Now that's the things concerning the Son of God. The Spirit of holiness. The only holy man to ever I love to think of the fact that the only holy man to ever live and nobody got it. Nobody understood. His brethren didn't. Neither did his brethren believe him. You know what that lets me know? The natural man doesn't have a clue as to what holiness is in the first place. The only holy man to ever live, nobody got it. Nobody understood. Well, they hated him. Somebody says, I want people to see Christ in me. Well, if they do, they'll kill you. They will. 
saw what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ when they saw who he was. Put him to death. But look what he says next. Declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Here's what proves he is God's Christ. His resurrection from the dead. Now he died. Why did he die? The sins of his people became his. He became guilty of the commission of those sins. God is just. The only reason for death is sin. My sin. My sin. My evil, my ungodliness, my unholiness, my perversity became his. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree. And what happened? God killed him. The justice of God. But unlike any other death, the moment he died, God was completely satisfied. His justice was satisfied. Not only was he satisfied with his son, he is eternally satisfied with everybody his son died for. And that's the things concerning Jesus Christ. He's the eternal God made of the seed of David According to the spirit of holiness, he lived a perfectly holy life. And he was resurrected from the dead. He died. He really did die. And we know why he died, because of sin. And he was raised from the dead. Now, those are the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is Paul's preaching. The kingdom of God. And those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way this is to be preached is with all boldness without hindrances, without worrying about whether or not men are going to believe. You see, in this thing of preaching, I can't make you believe. I can't make myself believe. My only responsibility is to preach the gospel and trust God to take care of the results. I'm not trying to get you to believe. I'm trying to preach the gospel. And I know that everybody that God has elected, Christ has died for, and God the Holy Spirit calls, will believe. I can't make somebody believe, but he does. He does. Now, I want to say this with all boldness and without any hindrances. What must I do to be saved? Good question, isn't it? Most important question you could ever consider. What must I do? There's something I must do to be saved. Now, he didn't say, what can I do to save myself? That's out of the question. You already know that, don't you? There's nothing you can do to save yourself. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the high name of him who is king of thy kingdom that you would enable everybody in this room to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Save us, O Lord, for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Dwayne, come leave us